thank you very much. Um, welcome to ElixirConf. Thanks for coming to the talk. Uh, great to see you all. Um, got a lot to cover today, so we're going to go right into it. Um, so this talk is essentially uh, a case study of the work that we've done at La Tote. Uh, La Tote is a fashion rental company. It's a subscription service. Uh, you get a box of uh, clothing and accessories every month. Uh, the difference is that you get to wear the items. Uh, if you like some, you keep them. Uh, the things that you uh, want to return, you return them all. Uh, and uh, we'll charge you for um, uh, the items that you kept. Uh, so we also maintain our own fulfillment center. Uh, and we wrote the software for that. So this case study is about extracting uh, that code from uh, the original Rails uh, code base. Uh, so why walking pace? Well, think about a fulfillment center. Um, there are people walking around with actual objects, uh, and as they uh, interact with those objects, they scan them, they weigh them, they pack them, uh, they pull them off the racks. That, those actions are our traffic. Right? So we uh, do not have a huge amount of load on our systems. Uh, performance is not the biggest deal for us. So many people do come to Elixir for the performance and the fault tolerance. Those are stellar, uh, no question about that, but performance was not our issue. Our issue was data consistency. Uh, so if we want to... Um, take a step back and see where we began. Uh, the original code base when uh, I got to Elixir, or when I got to uh, Latote, uh, was a Rails monolith. And as a Rails monolith, it, had, it did a lot of work. Uh, it had a lot of facets from customer facing uh, to admin, customer service, warehouse management, did all these different things. Uh, and by the way, we did choose to write our own uh, warehouse management system at the very beginning because we have uh, kind of a unique uh, need. We, we don't work the same way that most uh, fulfillment centers or warehouses do work. Um, so we do ship garments out uh, to people. They use them. They ship them back. But then uh, we process them and ship them back out again. In most warehouses, uh, items come in, they sit on the shelf for a little while, they ship them out, and it's an exception when they come back. So we had some uh, unique needs, and that's why we did write our own. Uh, so in uh, the fulfillment center itself, there's a bunch of stations. Uh, we receive new items, we get items back from customers uh, as returns, we have to clean them, restock them, and whatnot. And we can think of each one of these uh, steps, with each of these stations, as, uh, oops, uh, part, uh, as a, uh, a step in a state machine. And so we can model it that way, and in fact, originally we did model it that way. So that all sounds fine. Uh, so what's the problem? And um, we've got two words, multiple representations, but it's really multiple representations of the same thing, the same item across uh, the entire system. Uh, and so to see why that might be an issue, let's think about how we run Rails apps in production. So uh, in the beginning, you've got a node, you've got uh, a single thread, a single process. Uh, and you might have uh, an operation working on an item. So you've got an active record object, and uh, you've got a state machine object in that as well, more or less tightly coupled to it. So that's all fine, but then when we want to get uh, parallel uh, execution, uh, we need to fork that big Rails process. Uh, and we need to fork it a number of times um, to make use of all the cores on the machine. And then we get multiple nodes. Now, each and every time that happens, the likelihood of one of those forks on one of those nodes operating on the same item at the same time goes up. And turns out uh, that was an issue for us. Uh, so why does this actually matter? So in a, in a Rails app, it is a classic Rails app. It is fully stateless. Uh, we, well, stateless. Uh, of course, there's always state, but what we do is we stash it away in the database. Uh, in between requests, we go off and get it, uh, operate on it, and then send any changes to that state back to the database. Uh, so we're constantly reading and writing from the database, and that is the source of truth. 
But there's no guarantee about any of the order of the operations, and there's no guarantees about the length of time those operations are going to take. So in a word, we have race conditions. And those race conditions actually turned out to be real problems for us. We had a lot of stale data errors, a lot of state transition errors, things happening out of order. Uh, and if we want to uh, have a visual representation of how that might uh, come to be, uh, we've got two operations here. The one on the top begins first, but takes a lot longer. The one on the bottom uh, begins afterward, but is done more quickly. And we end up with the top one having stale data, right? This was happening more than we wanted. Uh, so the solution for us uh, was to find a way to have a single representation always of any item in the system at all times. And the point was so that we could enforce the order that uh, operations would happen. Okay? And how do we do that? So we've got this thing called the mailbox processes do, uh, and uh, gen servers do, of course. Uh, so now we can't enforce, in the beam, we can't enforce the order that messages are sent. But once they're received in the mailbox, uh, as long as we don't do anything to fast track the message processing, as long as we leave it stock, uh, we can enforce the order that they will be worked on. And we can enforce uh, a non-parallelism. Uh, they will be worked on in series. Again, a visual thing. So we, can't, we don't know uh, which messages are coming when, but once they get down to the mailbox, we can operate the, on them in series. Okay, so the rest of the talk is about how we made this happen, talking about some of the moving parts we'll need and some of the issues uh, we came up with and solved along the way. So the moving parts. Uh, so we've got to be able to represent state. Uh, we've got to have some form of data persistence. Uh, and then we need to represent the logic, which is really data transformations that we perceive as behavior. Uh, we'll need a gen server, a state machine, and a supervisor. So let's start with state. Now for us, um, that's pretty easy. And for this example, it's pretty easy. Uh, we can just use a struct. Uh, that will represent the row in the database for the entity that we're working on. Uh, we can, and obviously this is very simplified, we have, uh, <laughs> you wouldn't be able to read it if I put all, all the stuff in there. Um, we can always ensure that uh, we have values for keys using the enforce keys uh, um, uh, module attribute. Uh, we will always need an ID in state, but we don't always need a location ID because the item might be out uh, with the customer and then it would be sort of nonsensical to say it has a location in the warehouse. Uh, if we want to get fancy, uh, we can create a new function that will build uh, the state for us. Uh, so for this example, this might be overkill. If we had uh, a much more complex data structure that would uh, represent our state, think like uh, the connection struct uh, in Phoenix, it might be nice to have something. We give it a few parameters. It gives us a pre-made uh, uh, data structure out of there. So now this is an interesting thing. Um, so anybody here ever uh, have need of uh, a... Uh, a module attribute to use in a guard in multiple uh, modules. So we had that, yeah. It's a difficult thing. You can, it, it's easier at runtime because you can create a public function that will uh, make that available, but if you need it at compile time, uh, that's a little bit more challenging. So what we did is uh, we're a lot, um, creating a, a guard clause using def guard, and we're hiding this whitelist of states uh, that we will need in multiple modules behind that. So now this guard, as long as we import this module, the guard is available to us always. We have one place uh, that it lives. Okay, so that's it for state. I'll move on to queries. Um, so for this example, we'll just use ETS. We just need to make sure that it is, uh, the table is available to us at startup, uh, and we'll assume that something else is populating that table. Uh, in our real application, we have a mixture of Postgres and MySQL. Uh, we also do write 
uh, our own module here and uh, at Latote, we write our own uh, modules for queries. We have some very specific queries that we need to run, uh, and it actually is much easier to name them and, and write them out that way than um, using a lot of associations with Ecto. So here we are in our application.ex file. Uh, we, we're starting uh, this ETS table as we're starting the application. We want it to be public so that uh, any process can interact with it. We also want it to be a named table so that we can interact with it uh, using this uh, items uh, atom as the name so we don't have to hang on to a reference to it uh, and pass that around. We can just call it by name. Uh, so we need, uh, for this example, just the CRUD operations without the D. Uh, so we're going to create. Uh, notice we use uh, ETS insert new. Uh, this will uh, return true if the record doesn't exist already. It'll return false uh, if it does. So we can use that to pass an error back up. It would be kind of weird if we're going to try to create something we think is new but it already exists. We should sort of know about that. Um, update will use ets.insert, and that works more like an upsert. Uh, so it'll just overwrite anything that already exists in the table or create a brand new one uh, if it doesn't exist. And we need to fetch things, so we'll use ets.lookup. Okay, so far, so good. Uh, now, logic. So um, uh, in our case, what we've decided to do is pull out uh, uh, the logic that we use to transform the data from the gen server itself. Keep it in its own separate uh, plain module with functions. It makes it uh, easier to test, easier to reason about, uh, and um, all that logic is in one place. It also means, so for us, a, a gen server represents an item in the database, but items need to go through all of those stations. Uh, so we can separate out the customer returns logic from the polling logic, from the packing logic, uh, and we'll know quite easily where to go find something. So, oops, there we go. Uh, and so in, um, we'll need just a couple of public functions for this. The slice that we're gonna go look at is what you might call restocking. Uh, which is uh, an item comes back, goes through cleaning, and we need to put it uh, in the warehouse in a specific spot so that it's ready to be put into another tote and shipped out. Uh, and for that, we just need to set the location. So that's that. Honestly, that is the, the, where all the real work happens, is right in that line, just setting the new value for the location key. Uh, we'll also need to be able to change state as it moves from station to station. Uh, so we have another public function for that. And again, that's where the real work happens. And here's where we have allowed states again so that we're allowed to use that guard. Okay. Uh, good for the logic. Uh, on to the gen server. Uh, so the whole point of this is to be able to hold state in the gen server, so there's a couple things we need to think about. How do we get it there uh, in time? Um, and uh, so we need to pull that uh, state from the database on a NIT. Uh, with OTP21, we get this uh, delightful new handle continue. We'll talk about how that helps in just a sec. Uh, we'll use the queries uh, module that we uh, just wrote to go pull that data from the database. Now. Um, as we transform the data uh, and have that be our behavior, we need to make sure that we write that, those changes, we need to catch those changes and write them back down to the database. So we always have the freshest snapshot available to us uh, in case gen server crashes, node crashes, we need to be able to bring that state, the freshest state back up into uh, the new process that we'll get. Uh, so, so far, this is pretty standard gen server. Uh, we have a start link, uh, public start link function that takes the ID. The ID is the database ID of the item that we want to go get. Uh, we'll need that when we need to start up the state. So, uh, actually this, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, 
this public function wraps the gen server start link, which triggers uh, the init callback. Now, normally in init, we just say we would return OK and the new state that we want. Um, but init blocks until it returns. So if we have a process or an operation uh, that we need to do that's going to take a long time, that could fail, uh, init will block until that's done. Actually, early on, we would put the database calls uh, in here, and we realized that that actually became a bottleneck, uh, especially if we needed to start several processes in series. Um, that became a problem. Uh, in the old days, before we had handle continue, the old days meaning uh, spring of 2018, um, what we would do is we'd send a message to ourselves, and then we'd write a clause of handle info to handle that. And we hoped, we hoped that our message was the first message in the mailbox, right? But there was no guarantee of that. Uh, there might easily have been another message that would get in, the state would not be set, and that would crash the process. Not a good thing. Handle continue does ensure that uh, our, the clause for handle continue will be the first thing uh, that gets uh, operated on. So he, whoopsie, here is uh, uh, where all the, uh, the um, arguments to handle come from, handling co handle continue come from. Uh, we get the init from the second element of the continue tuple, and we get ID from um, the parameter that get passed through from init. Uh, and then we set the state uh, through handle continue there. We just go fetch it from the, the add stable. So we also need to provide the actual functions that will um, uh, that will do the work, the public functions that will do the things that we want them to do. So setting the location uh, is, we're in our gen server here, that's something we need to do, uh, and uh, it'll take the PID of the process that we want to set it for and the location ID. That, uh, because it also wraps a gen server call, will trigger the handle call callback. This is all pretty standard gen server stuff. Uh, so we'll get to this in a minute, that's the state machine. Uh, but the main thing is that we, uh, as any transformations happen, we catch those transformations in a variable and we write those back down as we return uh, from the callback. Okay, and we're done with gen server, onto the state machine. So in, uh, in the Rails uh, application, the state machine that we used was the state machine gem. Uh, and it makes some assumptions uh, that, uh, and it does some things that are useful, convenient, but maybe more complex than we actually want. So uh, with any state transition in the state machine gem, we can add a callback uh, that has side effects out in the world. Uh, and that's uh, convenient, but if you've ever tried to debug something like that when it goes wrong, uh, you have code that's firing off, you might not know when or where or why, it becomes more complex. So what we wanted to do is make this as dirt simple as humanly possible. So we, uh, right now we have a plain module and functions, uh, and they answer simple yes or no questions about state. So uh, while we took the business logic out into its own file, we're also going to take the logic around state and state transitions and uh, the rules really about uh, state and state transitions. We're going to take those out into their own module as well. We won't have any uh, behavior associated with state transitions at all. And finally, uh, empirical data wins, which means that when you're working with physical objects that people are moving around, humans do the darndest things. And they will do these things out of order. Uh, uh, so basically, if you're at a station and we're scanning a garment, that means that the garment is at that station. No matter what has transpired before, this is what we got now. So that's where we're going to run with. And this is essentially it. So uh, we have um, uh, our allowed states again, super useful. But uh, 
essentially this is, uh, the state machine is there to express rules. Uh, and one of the rules about restocking is you would think that for any garment that we put back on the rack and we scan it, that that's pullable, that's available to be put in another tote uh, ready to ship off to a customer, except if it's already in a tote that's set to be pulled, set uh, to be sent out to another customer, but not yet pulled. If we transition those uh, garments to pullable, what that would do is cause chaos because uh, things would be stolen in and out of totes all the time. So we have this idea of locked. If uh, a, an item is already in the state of locked, we don't transition it to pullable. And that is the top line, that's that rule. Uh, the middle line is if the state is in any of our allowed states, then it's okay. Otherwise, that means we got something really strange and that's an error, okay? So th that one function with three clauses uh, expresses those rules. And now we're back over here um, so we can see that if uh, the state machine says, yes, it's okay to, uh, to mark this item as pullable, we do those two lines, we set the location and set the state, Otherwise, we just set the location and we still write it to the database. Okay, so we're done with that. And the supervisor will come in a little bit. We don't quite have enough information for that. But now, so what we've got is messages coming in from the outside. Uh, the data flow is that they go through uh, the gen server public functions. They end up in the callbacks, which is where logic and the state machine will work on them to transform the state and then we always write it back down. Notice this is only going in one direction, not going in two directions, one direction. All right, now that's the kind of nuts and bolts, and now we get into the more interesting parts of it, to me at any rate. Um, so we had some problems that we had to think about. Uh, addressability, cold start, how do we start up a node uh, in a timely manner? Uh, how do we reduce the memory consumption? Uh, and how do we maintain high availability? So addressability, so the main question is, uh, we've got tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of processes running in the system at, uh, we would routinely run 750, 800,000 processes. How do we make sure that our message goes to the right process, the one process in all of those that we actually care about? Uh, and the answer is in several parts. So we can give a unique name uh, to each process, and we can uh, use a module to map that name to the actual PID, and then we send messages to the name and have that module uh, get the PID and send the message to the PID. So how does that happen? Uh, so via tuples are the way to give a process a name. Uh, the registry, which is actually relatively new, uh, allows us to map, uh, new in Elixir, uh, map uh, names to PIDs. Uh, and we can pass the via tuples around to any of the public functions that we have in our gen servers. Uh, and then inside the gen server, uh, we'll go query the registry, figure out what the actual PID is, and pass the message along. Um, so, interestingly, um, in the early days, before the registry, we wrote our own uh, uh, custom process registries. That's, uh, that was a legit thing to do, and you can do it. It's kind of fun. Um, originally, we just started with plain maps uh, to, hold it, uh, to hold the data. We used uh, ETS tables after that, and when the registry came along, we decided that that was a good thing to standardize on. Uh, so this is what a via tuple looks like. And by the way, any um, uh, process registry, whether it's custom or the one uh, that we get with Elixir, the registry, will always have a via tuple that looks like this. It's tagged with via. Um, it, uh, the second element of the tuple is the module that's handling uh, the registration. And then the third element is the name. So one thing we've got to do if we're going to use the registry is we've got to start it. So we're back in our application.ex file. We add it to the children uh, and start it under our supervisor. Uh, so then back in gen server land, uh, we add the name 
there, and that will uh, name uh, that individual process as it starts up uh, with the via tuple. Uh, and uh, we provide ourselves with a convenience function um, that means that we don't have to manually create a via tuple at all times. Uh, we can just pass it in an ID and it'll give us one back. We make this public so that any other process or any other module in the system uh, can easily get an item via tuple through this. Uh, a couple things about the registry. It's only local, uh, so it'll only register processes on a local node, not uh, across them. All right, so we got that one under. Uh, now, this is the one that, until we actually had a solution, I was nervous. Uh, I was like, how are we going to do this? So, uh, the cold start problem, so you've got to think about how are we going to start a node in a timely way if you've got a lot of records. So, you could think about starting them all at once, right? So, you're, you're, what that means is your node is not available until every single process is started. Because the one thing you cannot do is break the contract of saying, uh, if you send a message to this name, there must be a PID there waiting to answer that request. If you break that, all bets are off and the, the, you're going to have problems. So what if you've got millions of rows? Uh, what if your numbers of rows keep growing? How are we going to do this in a genuine, genuine way? So we had enough um, that uh, this was actually not going to work. Starting them all at once wasn't going to work. So then we thought, well, maybe we could start them in batches. We could create some heuristic about which ones we're going to need first. And I mean, we all work with computers. That's not going to work. We're going to get it wrong, right? So that one was out. And what we settled on was this idea of starting processes just in time. So the question, like, the thought was, what if we could just send a message to a name and if it existed, great, we'd pass it along. If it didn't exist, we would spawn that process and then pass it along. Uh, and that way, we can just start with a cold node and handle requests as they come in. So, oh, also, uh, GenServer where is, is great because you can pass it in uh, a via tuple and it will go query the registry with that name and get you back the PID if it exists. It'll return nil if it doesn't exist. We'll see that here. So the main, so we actually we created our own private call function for each individual type of gen server. So an item gen server or a tote gen server. They will have their own private call function. Uh, and the whole business is to try to get the PID, uh, whether we have to create it or whether it already exists, and then we pass that along to the normal genserver.call uh, function. So that's where we get the PID, uh, if it exists, or try to get the PID in any way. Um, and we'll get to the supervisor in just a bit. Uh, so then inside uh, the genserver public functions, we pull out genserver.call because we don't need it anymore, and we substitute our own private call function, right? Uh, and so that will always go through uh, the, the one that we just saw, and it will always ensure that we'll have a PID to send the message to. Uh, and so we standardize, again, on any public-facing functions, they will always get a via tuple, not a PID. We'll work on getting the PID inside uh, the gen server itself and pass it on. All right, cold, problem, cold start problem solved. I didn't have to worry anymore. Okay, so now with this information, now we can go back to our unfinished business from the first part of the roadmap and pick a supervision strategy. So we're finally at the supervisor. So we know that we're gonna be starting processes at runtime, probably stopping processes at runtime as well. Uh, and that says, well, again, in the old days, uh, maybe spring of 2018 it's, oh, again, uh, we would use a supervisor uh, with a simple one-for-one -one strategy, uh, but now we've got the dynamic supervisor which supersedes uh, that, and it, uh, it takes the place of it. Um, it um, uh, it's there to, to uh, it's there for starting processes that won't be there at, uh, at startup time for your node. 
we could, there's two ways of using any supervisor, dynamic supervisor or the regular supervisors. Uh, you can just use the built-in functions that they have in line, or you can create a module and add extra functions that you might want uh, there as well. For fun, we're just going to use uh, we'll use the module one. So uh, this has got the standard OTP kind of pattern. We've got a public start link function that calls a dynamic supervisor function that triggers the init. Uh, and if we want to add uh, our own functions, maybe we want to program programmatically start uh, our item server processes or programmatically stop our item server processes, we add that into that module. Uh, and again, uh, whoops, uh, the, um, all those publicly facing functions uh, standardized on the via tuple get passed around. So, supervisors, we're done with that. So the next thing we had to think about was memory, because the price that we pay for this data consistency is memory. So how do we keep that cost to a minimum? So there's a couple ways. One, uh, is there's, you can hibernate processes. Uh, so if you pass uh, the hibernate atom uh, as an extra last element of the return to, uh, reply tuple, uh, the gens, it's built into Gen Server to automatically uh, hibernate the process. But what that means is um, it, they will go through a garbage collection cycle. It'll try to compact the memory as much as humanly possible, even smaller than uh, what a process would normally be given when it's spawned. And then when uh, the process receives a new message, it's got to go through another uh, cycle uh, to expand that memory out, and then it's ready to, uh, to handle requests. But the hibernating process is still in memory. It doesn't terminate. It doesn't go away. So that doesn't get us as much as we want. Uh, but there is a way to set a timeout, an automatic timeout. This also is built into GenServer. And uh, the idea is to set uh, a number of milliseconds that you want the thing to wait for uh, before it will time itself out uh, as the last element of the reply tuple as well. So we can give uh, or create a module attribute uh, for a default that we use and uh, just use that mod module attribute wherever we want. So uh, let's say at 10 minutes and one millisecond, um, the process will send itself, it, without having a message, uh, the process will send itself a timeout message. So we need uh, a clause of handle info to handle that timeout message and return back a stop tuple. Uh, in order to handle the stop tuple, we also need a clause of terminate uh, that will, uh, the terminate callback that will pattern match on that. Do any cleanup and then stop the process. But since we've created a very specific clause for that, uh, we need to have the catch-all clause as well. Now, funny little thing, uh, if you don't reset uh, your restart strategy uh, to transient, your supervisor will never let you time out a process uh, because uh, the default uh, restart strategy is permanent which means that the supervisor will restart your process no matter what, even if you're really, really, really trying to terminate it. Uh, so if you make it transient, uh, the, if the process crashes abnormally, your supervisor will restart it uh, if you're trying to kill it in a calm and relaxed way. Um, the supervisor will let it go away. All right, so we got through the memory problem, and now high availability. So this is complex. Let's, let's uh, space, get that right out on the table right now. So we're going to look at this in a fairly simplified way. Um, so first of all, why is this a problem? In stateless systems, this is completely solved. We've got a load balancer. We rack up a bunch of boxes underneath it. We create a strategy to uh, balance the load across. If one or two of them drop off, we have other nodes to pick up the load. Easy. But what we've built here is an extremely stateful system. Uh, and if we try to uh, connect those nodes, especially with distributed Erlang, which would be the out-of-the-box solution, um, 
Strange things can happen. We'll show you in just a, a little bit of uh, a very simple version of what can happen. Also, we need a global registry. That's a solvable problem. There is global uh, available out of the box in OTP. Uh, but um, we know that networks go wrong. We know that connections between machines go wrong. We need a way to bring state back together again and heal it and make it right uh, when those uh, disturbances happen and we get back to a good state. So here's a minimal example. So let's say we've got a load balancer, uh, we've got two nodes, uh, the nodes are connected, and we've got an item server started on the left node. So now the load balancer sends a message uh, to the node on the right. Uh, because there's global registration, it knows that that process that it wants to reach is on the left node, passes the message over to the server, uh, to the item server that's over there. So all is good. Now the connection gets lost. Load balancer sends another message to that same process ID. Uh, to the right node, but because the right node can't talk to the left node, it can't get at that process, so it starts its own. So now we have two of representations of the same item in the system at the same time, and their state is different because the one on the right has got an extra message go through it, and it's already transformed its state. So this is bad. This is worse. Uh, because now the two nodes can talk to each other and they know that there's this double representation going on and now it's got to figure out what to do. Uh, that's where things get really interesting. And this is simple uh, because there's only been one message. What happens if there's been multiple messages, some of them go to the right, some of them go to the left. How do we figure out what's real and what's not? It's not last right wins. Okay. Uh, yeah, so this is where we have to heal state. This was a simple uh, version. Uh, how do we correct this? Uh, and it's possible that the, you can figure this out by replaying in order the messages from one to the other. There's, I'll talk about a package uh, in just a minute that might help us with that. Um, Luckily, in our world, we did not need more than one node for scaling, so we did not have to connect multiple nodes. We, our needs are for availability, and so there's another way to handle this. Uh, and there's, there are two versions of this. One's a two-node solution uh, with a load balancer and two nodes, but the nodes are not connected, right? So we have a load balancer, and it shovels all the traffic at one node and the other one is available, but completely idle. It's not taking any traffic. So now, if the active node goes down, or it can't be reached, the load balancer automatically takes all the traffic and sends it to what had been the idle node. And then it does whatever it needs to do with what had been the active node. Restart it, rebuild a brand new one from scratch, whatever. Now, uh, it's important to remember this is um, it's important to remember that if the condition was that uh, the node was not down but it was unreachable, that there may be some long living processes that are still working on that node uh, that will change the state. That's an edge case that we can live with. Right? Sometimes like, we could spend a lot of engineering resources to figure out a, a, pro a way around that problem. We did not. Uh, but there's another solution which eliminates that. This is a one node solution. Uh, so you've got a load balancer and a node in a container. Right? So if the container crashes or um, it's unreachable, we simply restart the container. Now, there's a difference between these two, which is uh, the amount of time it takes for recovery. So for the first solution, the amount of time it takes for recovery is the length in between your heartbeats and how long it takes to shunt the traffic off, which is very quick. In this solution, it's the amount, uh, the amount of time, the length of time in between your heartbeats and how long it takes to restart the container, and that might take a little bit. But in both solutions, 
the load balancer acts a little bit like a supervisor, right? Uh, and the difference is that in a supervisor, if uh, the process crashes, the child process crashes, it talks back to the supervisor. In this, the load balancer is always reaching out to the nodes below it. Uh, let's see, and this works because we have this just-in-time process spawning. So we can go from a cold node to totally operational instantaneously. In order to make this work, we gotta really know what down means, right? So uh, there's a lot of ways you can define that, and that is specific to your system. So what happens uh, if you need nodes for, more nodes for scaling? That's two or three or four talks, all in and of itself. We're not gonna get there. Uh, so you might look at Swarm. If you're gonna use Swarm, you might look at a hybrid logical clock library, uh, like HL clock, and what that will do is it'll give you a logical ordering event of events across nodes in a given time window. And if you have huge scale needs, you might wanna look at LASP or Partisan and or Partisan. Uh, all of those are on Hex. Uh, and by the way, I wrote this book. <laughs> uh, the book um, covers a lot of these topics, but in more depth, and we go um, much higher up the stack. We go through uh, Phoenix uh, and into HTML, uh, CSS. Uh, the good people at uh, Prague Prague uh, have given uh, us a, um, a coupon for 25% off for the ebook uh, that expires on uh, September 15th. Uh, it's Web Development, capital W, capital D, underscore Workshop, capital W, underscore 2018. That's an editor, not a uh, nerd picking the code. Um, at any rate, that's it. Thank you very much. I think we're like a minute or two over at this point, so. Yeah, we're doing good. Uh, do you want to do questions? Uh, Only if you've got time. We have a little extra time. Okay. Uh, does, uh, does anyone have any questions? My mic's still on. Oh, wait. Martin gave me some delightful special water from Denmark, so I don't know if Martin's here. Great. Okay. I've got one. Sure. Can you go over how you uh, pull DB info without being inside the init function? Sure. So the question is um, how do you get, um, how do you keep the init from blocking if you need to go to the database uh, and get uh, information for, uh, to set the state? So inside the init, you can uh, send yourself a message. Just use process.send uh, self, and then uh, something that you want to pattern match on, like an atom of go get my data. And then uh, you can have a, a clause of handle info that's go get my data. You go do the long acting process, uh, and then whatever the result of that is uh, becomes the new state in your no reply tuple. Yeah, it doesn't block at that point because init is already, it's, it's done its job, but then there's that little gap where you might have potentially other messages coming in. Very small, but potential. Yes? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that is the thing. So you will have some downtime. Um, that's why I presented two solutions. So if you have the, the one solution, uh, you're, the amount of downtime, the, with, with two nodes, one on standby. Yeah, I'll just switch over. That's, that's super instantaneous. The one node solution with the node in the container, yes, you, you're absolutely, the maximum downtime will include however long it takes to restart your node. Um, now, that, sometimes that's quick, sometimes it's not. It, it, in our use case, being down for 20 seconds, it's not great, but it's feasible. 